everyone, it's Dr. Wood. Uh, if you want to let me know if you can hear me, appreciate it. I don't know if it's too quiet or... Perfect. Playing around my setup a little bit here, so hopefully it's... Uh... Well, let me know if it's not. Maybe try like a helium filter later to see if I can get a little more interesting for you all. <clears throat> Y'all for joining me today. Appreciate it. I know your Friday afternoon is precious. Not too uh, important for you. And this will be our last, um, this will be the end of the material for the, the first exam. So um, next time we meet, we'll do like our little journal club, which I posted the um, article for that. And then we will um, do the review as well. We'll kind of go through and show you how those actually work. I was surprised though. Um, I looked at the. If I can pull this up, actually. I thought the breakdown for the um, quiz for your topic list that you guys wanted to see was actually pretty interesting. Um, Normally you expect stuff like ortho and derm and all that to be like sort of the highest, but um, yes, it is quite the spoopy Friday. Um, but behavioral health actually was number one, which I was um, quite surprised by. It's not usual, but it's good. I like that uh, the guys are interested in that, or at least well over half of you are. And emergency medicine, my fave. Um, yeah, so the article I pulled was actually from uh, pretty recently. I think this was in August. Yeah, so it was August of this year. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, 2018. So it was pretty pretty recently, but it's from JAMA Psychiatry. So it's actually a pretty, pretty big uh, journal there. So we'll be able to go through that a little bit. I, I'm going to bring this up, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we get into the actual PowerPoint. I'll start in a moment. Hello, everyone. Thank you all. I think I've hit my own rite of passage on YouTube. I started getting some strange spam uh, about, it's always like different people's accounts and they're posting about uh, different doctor's names and about how their herbal cures fixed their genital herpes. And I was like, it's like always the same indication. I'm not, it's not even on video where I talk about that at all. It's very, so anyway, so I just have to delete those. They come up, but regardless, let us carry on. Okay, well, welcome back to uh, Epidemiology and Biostats, your absolute favorite course, which I'm sure your evals will uh, corroborate. Um, welcome back to 2020. Things just get weirder every day, it seems like. Um, so let's do our last section here. This is kind of putting together a lot of the things we've been talking about so far in terms of... Um, you know how journal articles are put together we'll talk a little bit about and review some topics in terms of things like um, risk and odds ratios and all that stuff just to really tie, tie a nice bow on it to make sure everyone's kind of on the same page here okay so first off just to reiterate a little bit about choosing statistical tests that we're going to use and re remember you want to think about like what um, specifically you're trying to test for when you do these um, tests here right and so thing um so anyway so make sure that when you're considering like what specifically you're testing for that um you're using the correct test because if you don't then you're going to get erroneous results right and so this is where this table can kind of in the next couple of tables will, will help you out and and if you have questions on this definitely let me know because i'd like to be able to to clarify these things for you so first off if you want to find out if you're using something that is normally distributed or not this is where we're going to be using things like normality tests and outliers, right? These tests just show us that the data that we have from the sample that we 
I've gotten data from, um, are the results that we found, are they consistent with what you would find with a truly random, normally distributed set of data, right? And it says, you know, what are the chances are that you find the differences you found between this and what an ideal normally distributed set of data, how, what are the chances you find those kind of differences there? And if it's quite low, then you, you can reject that null hypothesis and say, I'm not using normally distributed data. That's that normality test, right? Um, versus an outlier test looking at one particular value to say like, hey, does, would this normally have come from a normal distribution or is it highly unlikely that it would have? Um, then we get into our more descriptive statistics. This is where we're just describing a single sample, right? So we're talking about things like frequency distributions, just counting things, how often they pop up, your sample means, which is again, all the values added up divided by your n or the number of observations you made, your minimums and maximums, your range, uh, 25th, 75th percentiles, and then standard deviation. Most of you probably have a pretty good idea about what that is. Um, again, standard deviation being sort of the variability in the data around the mean. If you were trying to make inferences about one population, this is so if I take like a single data set and I then try to compare that back to a population, that's going to be a one sample t test. This is not done quite as often because frequently a lot of the, the journal articles we're going to look at and this stuff you'll see is actually going to be comparing two groups to one another. And so this is where our unpaired t test comes into play. This is probably one of the more common ones you'll run into because this is where you're taking two groups that are unrelated and then looking to see the differences in their means if those differences are due to just a chance alone or is there actually a difference there, right? So uh, there's that. If you're doing two match groups or if you're doing siblings or uh, pre-post on a patient or if you're running maybe a parallel tests on a patient, like if you wanted to compare, you know, um, uh, you know, oral temperatures versus rectal temperatures in the same patient, that would be a paired test, right? So in that case, you'd be using a paired t-test in that instance there, okay? All pretty straightforward. Getting into more than two groups, that's where our ANOVA actually comes into play, right? Remember, we do an ANOVA to find out if we have, say, more than two groups. We find out, is there any differences amongst those groups, right? It doesn't tell us where the difference is. It just says if there's one there or not, right? And then after that, you have to follow it up by the multiple comparisons test. Remember when you do that, that how many ever tests that you're going to run, you have to divvy up your alpha of 0.05 amongst all those comparisons. So if you do 10 different comparisons, then it's going to be 0.05 divided by 10 or 0.005. You're only doing, you know, two comparisons, then you'd be doing 0.025 as your new alpha for each of those comparisons you're making after the initial ANOVA. Okay. Um, now, if you're doing, uh, that's for unpaired groups. If you want to do it with paired groups, that's where your repeated measures ANOVA comes into play there, right? So very similar to the differences between an unpaired and a paired t-test. That's where that comes into play. Um, and then we also talked about a two-way ANOVA, which would be if you were looking at groups um, based off of two uh, independent variables, right? In the example that we looked at, we were looking at uh, initially our one-way ANOVA was looking at um, different degrees of running uh, prowess, I guess you could say, between different groups of women. And then they also factored in their age. That was then two independent variables, age of the patient, and then the running status, and then using that, that's going to be a two-way ANOVA in that situation there, okay? We then talked about being able to look at correlation between uh, different uh, variables. We talked about simple linear regression. Um, don't worry about simple nonlinear. We didn't really cover that one, but certainly linear regression we talked about and how it's important to know what your X and Y are and how you're predicting Y from X, right? So that's important to know. And then we talked about linear regressions and how we could take multiple independent um, variables and look to see how they contribute to being able to predict why. That was the case where you used lead concentrations affecting serum creatinine and how they also looked at age of the patient, whether they use diuretics and all those other factors, right? Again, kind of have a feeling for how these tests are going to be used here. Um, so let's say we're looking at an example. Let me see. Um, okay, so if we're doing it from non Gaussian distributions, right? So if we are switching from parametric test, which everything on this page here is a parametric test, and we're switching gears and looking at our non-parametric test, okay, or non-Gaussian distribution-based test, right? So in these cases here, uh, remember, we're not using the mean anymore, we're using the median, because all of these statistical tests are based off of ranking the values from highest to lowest, basically. And so you can still do things like frequency distributions, but instead of the mean, you're using the sample median, and then you're more likely using the um, the 25th and 75th percentiles to kind of help you out there, okay? Um, 
Now, as a, when looking at inferences about one population, that's where we're going to get into our Wilcoxon's rank sum test, which we mentioned there. Um, more importantly, when talking about the analog, non-parametric analog to an unpaired t-test, this is where we get the Mann-Whitney u-test. So this is kind of the, the big analog or uh, cousin to the unpaired t-test. Then we also talked about the paired one being the Wilcoxon matched pairs test. Okay, so be able to kind of recognize those on an exam as being, you know, I will, I, I could give you examples of a study um, and I say this is what you're comparing the data you determine to be non normally distributed you want to compare two groups which are independent from one another which test would you use okay so the first clue is to look to see whether your stuff is parametric or not and then or if you can assume it's under normal distribution or not and then look at what the comparison actually is okay so if you can do that you should be pretty good for at least a few questions on there now, we also talked about um, survival times. Remember we talked about those curves there a little bit and how we talked about Kaplan-Meier survival curves and how those are really useful to give us an idea of, you know, you can make comparisons between groups to see how survival time compares. Or you could just look at even at one sample if you wanted to. Um, remember, we don't use mean survival time for those. We use median survival time. Remember why is because, again, when you're doing Kaplan-Meier survival curves, it has to be something that has a very definitive sort of um, like either it happened or it didn't. You either died or you didn't, right? It can't be something that can happen multiple times. And so because of that, if you're looking at something like death, you know, people have a tendency to live a long time in some instances. And so you'd have to run really long studies. So it's really hard to do that. And you'd have to have the actual survival time for every single patient come up with a mean survival time versus with medians, I just have to know when I get to the 50% mark, right? I only have to know when I get halfway through that. So say, for instance, you're running a uh, study with um, 100 people in it, you were looking at, you know, survival rates for them. Um, I don't have to wait till every single one of those 100 people die in order to figure out what the mean survival time that doesn't really help me out. I get the median survival time the second that 50th person dies, and then I know what it is. And then I can go say, okay, this is the median survival time. It's 3.7 years or 10.5 years, whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, and then two, you know, five year survival percentages, you see those quite frequently with like cancer studies and things like that. Okay. Um, all right. So we're talking about inferences about a population. Remember we talked about confidence intervals around that, how you can actually look at that to get a better idea of how this would actually compare to the greater population if you were to do that. Okay. Um, don't worry about so much about these log rank tests. We didn't really get into those uh, so much uh, in terms of this. So these two boxes, I wouldn't really worry about too much. Um, let's see, when we're looking at outcomes, especially if you're looking at binomial outcomes, so if you're looking at like yes, no, died or not died, um, you know, had a baby, didn't have a baby, whatever the case may be, um, how you describe those is typically just proportions, right? Because um, there's not like individual values you can count, you can basically just count how many yeses you had and how many noes you had, how many x's you had, how many y's you had, etc. Um, and so when you're doing that, you know, it can be a little bit more difficult to do, um, you can't really do things like t-tests on the, that data because it doesn't really make sense. T-tests have to be done on like continuous data. This is binomial in, in nature. Um, and so this is where we can do things like Fisher's exact test, where we can look at the proportion in between two different unpaired groups. And that can help us out to see if, if there's an actual difference in there. And again, you're just counting how many of each category you had basically. So this is the one I'd probably want to remember out of this group here because again, this one we, we kind of mentioned. Um, the paired example of that would be a McNamara's test, but I'm, I'm probably not going to ask a question on that. On the exam. Um, and then we didn't talk about logistic regression, so um, we just talked about the uh, multivariable regression. So anyway, again, if I didn't talk about it, uh, don't worry about it. Those are just kind of summary tables that I pulled that, that are useful. So let's kind of tie it all together and talk about sort of the bones of an article, right? So um, how are articles normally going to be organized? And, and again, in the first place, you may be asking yourself this question, well, why even read the literature in the first place? Why even do that? Well, it's important. If you want to be an evidence-based practitioner, you have to be able to evaluate literature, see um, whether something is a good treatment plan for your patient, see whether it's a bad one. Um, remember that um, you can't just fall on the, the, the whole thing. Well, up to date said to do it, so I did it. You want to be able to have a better reason for, for uh, than that, you know? So why do we read articles, well, it could be because there's new health problems that are out there. So maybe you're really interested in COVID-19. And so you're looking up a lot of stuff about that, new treatments, perhaps, um, you know, looking at things like tests for diagnosis and prognosis, that's actually really helpful. You know, for instance, if you work in the ER, and you want to find out if there's a better way to see for a patient coming in for chest pain, 
and you're ruling out a PE, are there better ways to do that than having to put them in a CT scanner? Perhaps maybe there's a new scale that has come out that uh, is less invasive that gives you a better clue, for instance. Or if there are new treatments and all kinds of things. And of course, you know, expert recommendations are helpful if coming from, you know, like uh, uh, society guidelines or something like that. So lots of reasons to read the literature. Um, or if you're bored and you want to go to sleep a little faster, that, that can also help you out too. Um, generally speaking, this is how your articles are going to be broken down. So basically, you're going to start off with your abstract or your summary. Um, most every article is going to have one of these where it basically kind of lays out um, the general point of an article, things like that. So one thing I did want to show you all is if you go to... If you go over to your uh, modules in the class, you'll notice I put an article here. This is going to be for our first journal club next week, I believe, uh, before our review. And I went ahead and pulled it up here so we can check this out just to show you like what some of these things actually look like. So in this case here, let me know if it's like the print is too small or something uh, for you. But you can see here, so first the title of the article, Efficacy and Safety of Intranasal Esketamine, Adjunctive to Oral Antidepressant Therapy and Treatment Resistant Depression, a Randomized Clinical Trial. As you can tell, scientists are really bad at naming these articles here. Uh, it doesn't really fall, roll off the tongue very well, but it doesn't matter. It's descriptive, and that's what's important. So the first thing that's always going to be here is going to be the abstract. This is basically telling you the quick, you know, 30-second sort of um, advertisement for, um, you know, what the study did, what it actually found, and um, their, a little bit of their conclusions. So... Um, the trap, though, is a lot of people stop right here. They just read the abstract, and then they don't do anything further. The thing that was drilled into my mind when I was learning this stuff is that the devil is in the details. It's very easy for an abstract to be misleading. They can leave out important information. Uh, they don't include all the details. So don't be the type of practitioner that just reads the abstract and doesn't do anything further because you can miss some stuff there, right? And so I said, I was, you know, my wife and I always have kind of a running joke between one another. Um, you know, she'll mention some article to me or something like that. And I was like, oh, well, how many, um, you know, patients uh, were included in this? What were their exclusion criteria? And she'll be like, well, I didn't. I just read the abstract. And I was like, oh, just reading the abstract, are we? And then normally throw something at me and I realize I shouldn't have said that. But regardless, this is what the abstract is for. It's kind of like the advertisement. It's kind of like watching a movie preview, if you will. So. Getting back to the PowerPoint. So then you're going to have your introduction. This kind of gives you a brief overview of like why we even care about this topic in the first place. So for instance, in the article I was showing there, um, we know oral antidepressant therapy isn't like super great. Uh, you know, it's not the best thing it could be. And so they're always looking for new ways of managing depression that may be resistant to oral treatment. So that's why they were looking at the use of a new drug as ketamine for that. Um, and so they tell you why this is important, why they need to look at it. And usually they'll kind of catch you up on where the research is on the topic thus far. Then you'll get into really the meat of the article itself. You're going to talk about the methods, materials, methods, patients and methods. There's a couple of different ways I'm going to call it. This is super important because this is how they actually designed the study. This is actually what they did, how they found patients, how they enrolled them, um, what groups they broke them off into. How do they control for bias? How do they do all these things here? And so if they find if you find flaws in the methods then it's going to be harder to take any sort of credence and the results that you find there to actually mean anything for you right because ultimately what you're trying to figure out is like does this actually change anything about my practice is this going to help me to better treat my patients right because that's what we're ultimately here for and again you're not going to read everything out there so you have to be very selective about how you do this uh, and make sure you're reading things that are going to be worth your time because these can be a little bit laborious to get through as you'll find um, next, once they describe all of the analytic techniques, all the, the actual methods there, they'll get into the results. They'll actually tell you what happened. Now, they're not going to give you every single data point that they collected there, but they'll show you graphs and charts and give you summaries of things. This is where all your p-values are going to come from. They'll say, okay, we found this kind of difference, and the p-value is less than 0.05, or whatever the case may be. Okay, so those are the results. They will then get into their discussion. And so this is where they talk about what they found, why they think they found what they found, um, limitations of their study, things that they might do in the future, and then they get into their conclusion, basically tying everything up, right? So it's, you know, a pretty straightforward sort of thing. They were telling you why we're doing this, how they did it, what they found, and kind of where they go from there, okay? Uh, and then finally, the references and bibliography, also very important because you want to see what kind of stuff they were pulling from in case you want to do any further reading, right? So as I mentioned, 
Um, the summary of the abstract is basically them putting their best foot forward. So it's frequently um, not as detailed as you would like in a lot of cases, or they leave out certain bits of information that may be really pertinent to deciding what kind of conclusions you can draw from an article or not. Um, and the structure of these will change by journal to journal. If you ever have the opportunity, opportunity to write a journal article, you're going to find they have very specific guidelines for how to do these things and uh, how things should be structured and what font and you should use. And uh, it turns out Comic Sans is not one you should use. I got rejected a lot trying to put Comic Sans in my articles. But regardless, um, the summary is, again, the coming attractions. It's the preview for what the actual article is itself. Introductions, mainly just giving you background, showing you the rationale for why they're actually interested in this in the first place. Because if there's no interest in doing the study in the first place, then they wouldn't have done it, right? Um, they'll also typically give you like some previous um, you know, kind of a recap of previous literature done in that particular field. Okay. Um, the methodology is super important here. This is where you actually find out like what kind of patients they included, um, how they designed the study, if they did randomizations, um, how they organized people, how they collected the data. Often skip because this is the driest, most boring section out of the whole thing. Right? It's kind of like, um, you know, you don't really care how the pie got made. You just want to eat some tasty pie. You want to read that conclusion. Um, but Sometimes it's important to know how the pie is made to make sure there's nothing bad in there that you don't want to eat. Um, so, you know, things like, you know, how pertinent is this, is this to your particular patient you're dealing with? Maybe you're trying to figure out what the best treatment is for your 89-year-old um, black female patient, but the study only looked at white males between 20 and 30 years of age. May not be exactly uh, generalizable to your particular patient, and the methods can kind of tell you that. And so this is an important thing to read. Uh, getting into the results, you're going to find this is where they then organize all of the things that they found. This is where you have the charts and tables and graphs and all that good stuff. Again, not every data point will be present, but they give you a good summary of what the actual numbers or what they found were. And again, you can kind of stop there if you wanted to. You can basically look at that information and be able to draw conclusions of your own to see whether they found any significant differences, whether or not it's clinically significant to your particular patients that you deal with. Um, and again, typically you're reading things that are pertinent to your interest. Um, you know, for me, I like to read tox articles because that's what I do. That's what I still um, take call for. And so I have to be up to date on that stuff in order to make sure that I have good recommendations for the providers who call me up at 3.30 in the morning, which definitely happened this week. Um, and then we get into our discussion or comment. Um, again, this is where the authors are sort of giving their two cents, giving their opinions on what they found in terms of, um, you know, what things they were surprised by, what things they thought would happen, why they think things happen the way they happen, all that sort of thing there, right? So this is where you kind of get the most spin on it from the author's perspective. And so this is important to consider that because um, they may be accentuating things and sort of downplaying other things in order to make their article sort of look as good as it can kind of human nature, not a whole lot you can do about that other than, you know, having editors read it and say, hey, you should probably tone this down, something, something like that. But it tends to be the most speculative section, right? Versus the results, which are just the data, you know, is very objective. This can have a tendency to be a slightly more subjective. And then, as I mentioned, your reference bibliography, um, obviously these have to be here because, um, you know, you don't want to pull information just out of thin air. Typically, you want to make sure you include everything that you sort, uh, cited um, in your bibliography to make sure people can go and do their own research on that stuff and see if you thought you summarized from that was actually true or not, right? So as I mentioned, um, be selective in how you approach an article. And I have a whole section about this. So, um, you know, you're not going to have any research courses during the winter. Winter is hard enough as it is. But we are going to have a research methods course in the summer semester where things are a little bit more laid back uh, for the most part. Um, but this is going to be, I have a whole course just talking about how do you find articles, how do you review them uh, more in depth and pull it all together in order to make a research project. Uh, basically, you'll have a 10 to 15 page paper you'll be writing based off of your ability to scour the literature and um, about something you're really interested in. So, but... Anyway, so basically, you know, you'll have your journals you go to, for instance, clinical toxicology is one I go to because that's sort of our main ox journal. If you're really into behavioral health, then maybe JAMA Psychiatry is what you're really into. You can't read everything because there's just too much out there. And so um, you'd rather be, you know, a master of one trade versus a, a, a jack of, or a master of none, I suppose I should say. Um, so really, you're going to be selective about this. Basically, you'll scan through, see if you find an article that is pertinent to your interests. Uh, you'll then kind of read the abstract real quick, see if it deserves further 
diving in, right? See if it does, uh, warrants further uh, analysis by you to actually read the whole full thing, right? And then, as I mentioned, concentrate on the method section. I know this is difficult. It's hard to read, but, it, you know, you get used to it after a period of time. You get better at being able to tease out sort of the most important points as you do that there, right? Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about study design specifically, because I've been kind of alluding to it a lot here. And um, these are basically how you can sort of group your various types of, of trials here. And so again, um, you should be able to describe these, especially if like for testing purposes, kind of the differences between all of these different trial types. And we'll kind of get into that now. Um, so you can come back and read this. I'm gonna be talking about each of these individually as we go through it here. So first off, descriptive studies. These are kind of like the easiest to do. Um, however, they are gonna give you the least amount of information in terms of like cause and effect. Um, but they can be useful like starting points to give you like more uh, kind of like a jumping off point to do for future research, right? Um, this is going to be more so um, where you're doing like retrospective chart reviews and, and things like that or just documenting things just as they happen without the researchers having any direct intervention here, right? So they don't provide any detailed explanations for the cause of disease nor evidence um, to evaluate, say, like a new treatment. They can just look for trends and things like that in the data. Um, for example, things like Kaposi sarcoma, you may just look at the incidence of Kaposi sarcoma in patients with HIV. Um, you may not do any actual direct interventions like any sort of preventative therapy or, or things like that. Um, but you're collecting all the data to look at how the, the information is moving, the data is trending. And so again, as I mentioned, this is a good starting off point for future data or future research. If you notice there's a trend there, maybe you want to look at it further to see what's causing that trend to occur, right? Next, we want to do explanatory studies where we can actually start to make some comparisons between things. So we can try to either find like etiologies into specific disease states or perhaps find out which treatments are better for a certain kind of patient. And in these cases, they can either be experimental or observational. So overall, the overarching category is explanatory because uh, they're looking for explanations. And then you get more drilling down into experimental versus observational. With experimental, this is where the researcher is actually having some sort of input. This is where they're actually having some sort of um, direct intervention in your patients here. And so for instance, there's what we call like a controlled trial, right? So when they say controlled, that generally means like placebo controlled for the most part, or in a lot of cases. So you start out with your study population that you're interested in, and then they get generally randomized into two groups, either experimental or interventional group, and then your control group. Doesn't mean they're always getting placebo. In a lot of cases, it could just be like gold standard treatment. And then your experimental treatment would be like, say, a new drug, for instance, or a new treatment modality. Um, you know, sometimes it's not ethical to not give patients actual treatment. Um, so, for instance, like with HIV, we know that treating them with antiretrovirals extends their life. And so it would be pretty unethical if we gave them nothing just to see how a different drug works for them, right? And so, basically, when you do that, and again, you are doing this prospectively because the researchers are having an intervention, so it has to be prospective. You start out at a current point in time, you enroll your study or participants, you randomize them into one of these two groups, and then you find out who has the outcomes that you're interested in, whether it's death or disease progression or uh, changes in blood pressure or whatever the case may be, right? So you're getting, you're following it in time, so it's prospective in nature. In terms of observational, these are easier to do. They're less costly because you're just looking at something. You're not actually having any direct intervention. Maybe you're taking two groups of people um, and divvying them up based on, um, for instance, like their uh, exposure to a carcinogen and looking to see who has cancer or something like that. You're just looking to see what happens without doing any direct interventions. Again, something like this with an experimental trial gives you a lot stronger cause and effect sort of uh, links you can take a lot more credence in the findings that you have there um, because you're directly controlling what's happening here. You're randomizing people into one of these two groups. Um, it gives you much stronger evidence for something, but more costly to do is more difficult, or you just might not be able to do it based on the, the ethics of the, the issue there. Um, <clears throat> Now, the observational studies, you know, you're able to um, compare groups. You're able to try to find some explanations for different medical mysteries, of which there are many. Um, and again, the researchers are bystanders, right? So they may look at the natural course of health events. So they may just see like, okay, well, what happens to HIV patients who are non-compliant and are not taking antiretroviral therapy? What happens to them? You're just observing it, 
without having any direct intervention, then it's less of a kind of sticky ethical sort of situation there, uh, depending on how it's kind of done. But you're gathering data, and then you can classify and sort the data in order to give you some inferences about what's going on. The three main types you're gonna run into include case control, some follow-up uh, ones, or we talk about uh, cross-sectional studies here. So case control are typically gonna be retrospective in nature. Basically, you're starting out with the outcome. So whether someone has the disease, which are going to be your cases, and then they are matched with control patients who do not have the disease in question. We've talked about these before and how they can be useful for things that have um, very low incidence or low prevalence within a population. So typically you may have like, you know, one case and then like three to five controls, for instance. And the purpose of doing that is because I can't randomize people in this sort of case, because again, all the data I'm using is, is retrospective when I do these types of studies. Um, so I have those controls in order to account for um, different confounders. So things like, you know, gender, so I don't be matching male patients with male patients, or um, age, I don't be matching elderly patients with elderly patients. Um, so that way I can take it out some of those variables and control for those sort of things. So I can just look at whether or not those people had the presence of a risk factor or not, okay? so cases you have your controls and then you look backwards in time and you see whether or not they were exposed to a particular risk factor so i could look at people who um had let's say who developed flu in 2020 let's say i'm in i'm in the future actually I'll, I'll do it last year let's say i'm looking at um the incidence of flu in the year 2019 and I have people who got the flu and people who didn't get the flu and i look backwards to see who got vaccinated versus who didn't in this case here the risk factor is whether or not they were vaccinated the outcome, which I already started with, was whether they had the flu or not, okay? So that's kind of the key thing with case control studies, starting out with people with the disease, matching them to people who don't have the disease, and then looking backwards to see if whether or not they had a risk factor that the researchers are interested in. These are retrospective in nature, okay? Um, with a follow-up um, study, sometimes these are gonna be called uh, cohort studies. Probably more commonly you'll see cohort studies. I'm sorry if my big head's in the way of the picture here, but you have the PowerPoint you can look at. Um, basically, you'll go ahead and start out with a study population, and you're gonna then um, basically, and these are generally prospective, but they can be retrospective depending on how they're designed. But you start off with your study population, and then you can divvy them up into groups based on whether or not they have the presence of a risk factor. You're not giving them the risk factor, you're just seeing, just basically breaking them up into groups based on what the risk factor was, or if they had it or not, okay? So in this case here, I could start out with a study population of uh, Americans, and then I could say, okay, well, let's put the, the smokers into one group, that's exposure to a risk factor of uh, nicotine exposure, and then I look at the people who are non-smokers, and then I follow them for an outcome, whether it be cardiovascular disease or lung cancer or whatever the case may be, okay? So see how this is kind of different than a case control study where I started out with the disease and then I look backwards to see who had the risk factor, with a cohort study or follow-up design, I start out with whether or not they have the risk factor and then I follow them to see whether they have the disease, right? The outcome I'm interested in. So they're kind of opposite of one another in a way and they can kind of tell you some different things. Um, again, the case control studies are better for things that have low incidence or very rare diseases um, versus this might be easier for um, studies that have, or for uh, things that have, a lot of people have the risk factor. So there's a lot of smokers out there. There's a lot of um, you know, people with hypertension. You could look at all kinds of things. So in some cases you can do what they call a cross-sectional study. And so this sort of blends the two together here. This is not done as often, um, but you can do these sometimes as sort of just get a, a snapshot in time of what's going on. You can basically just look at a single point in time um, to see what the prevalence of a particular risk factor is um, in patients who have the disease or not, right? So you can break them up into either risk factors or um, based on the disease state and then do a cross-section to see, okay, well, you know, how many of these people had the, the outcome or how many people these had the, the risk factor and then make some comparisons there. Not done as frequently, um, but just know that they are something that can, can happen. So um, questions you want to start to consider here when you're looking at this stuff is, okay, well, you know, is the design descriptive or explanatory effort? You know, is the author really just trying to detail something that's happening? Or are they looking to make some comparisons um, in evaluating intervention? So for instance, um, and again, I talk a lot about the research that I've done because it's what I know best. 
Um, so when I was in fellowship, I did my research on coral snake envenomations, right? Because I was at the Florida Poison Center and coral snakes are particularly, um, um, it's a very Florida problem. You know, eastern coral snakes are just not really a big deal outside of Florida. A little bit in Texas, but mostly just in Florida. So I wanted to look at that because it was just a very Florida thing and I thought it was interesting. So, um, and basically... You know, I could have just done an observational study just to say, well, what are the trends in people who get bit by coral snakes and how many of them got antivenom, how many didn't, how many people had anaphylaxis from that and all this kind of stuff. But instead, what I did was more of an explanatory effort because we we're having an issue with drug shortage. They actually stopped making the antivenom for a while there. And we were actually giving out of date medications um, that the FDA was having to approve year to year. Um, and so I wanted to see, like, well, did people do worse if we waited to give them antivenom, or do they do just as well as people who got antivenom right away? Again, don't worry about the details of that. Just know that I was doing more of an explanatory effort, so I ended up doing a retrospective case control study. And it basically was breaking up people on whether or not they got antivenom immediately or they were delayed, and I looked at their outcomes, right? So the risk factors, whether they got antivenom early or not, and then I looked for the outcomes that happened there, okay? So... Try to analyze the study to see what the design is, and they'll typically tell you right there in the in the first line. They'll tell you, "Hey, this is a randomized controlled trial. This is um, a retrospective case control study. You know, things like that." They'll basically just say it right out there. If the comparisons are being made, is it investigator observing course of events, creating experiment by assigning subjects to have an intervention? Like, are they getting a pill or an exercise program? That's more of an interventional sort of study there, right? This is an experimental study. If the researchers are implementing some sort of intervention. Okay, the design is observational. Are patients who already have the disease or outcome compared with unaffected controls or pre-existing characteristics, right? That's going to be your case control studies there. Um, again, those are pretty easy to, to pick out because, again, they're starting out with people who already have the disease and then looking to see were they exposed to a particular risk factor, okay? Okay, so let's talk about some of those interpretations of the data that we get there. So let's talk about risk um, and some examples of that and some caveats I want to kind of... Um, uh, bring to light or kind of accentuate here for you guys. So, um, you know, we are faced with risk all the time. Everything you do is has a risk associated with it. Even walking outside, maybe you'll get COVID. Who could say? Um, but basically, we're trying to evaluate sort of the benefit of treatment versus potential liabilities, either harming the patient. Um, maybe it could be, you know, missing a diagnosis. It could be Side effects from a medication could be lots of different things there. And so risk is helping us to determine sort of how we can compare those risks versus benefits to find out, okay, is this intervention worth it for my patients? Does this reduce the risk of something bad happening to them? Um, and again, when you're looking at this, in order to determine risk, you have to know what the denominator is. You have to know the total number of people who are at risk. And so this is something you're going to see a lot with um, prospective, like randomized controlled studies. You're going to see this a lot with cohort studies where you have a defined number of people that you've recruited. Okay, Because you know exactly if I recruit 100 people into a study, I know those 100 people are at risk. Okay, And so that's going to be my denominator there. So that's the important thing. And then you find what a relative risk is by measuring the strength of association between a particular exposure, which could be a medication or a surgery or something like that, um, and an outcome um, together with a different group. So either they have the exposure to the risk factor or they don't. You look to see how many of them have the outcome in each of those groups, and then you compare that risk together. You get a relative risk to one another. And so you're going to find that the larger that risk or the uh, ratio of that, the stronger the association. So really high risk, uh, relative risk is going to include, can be basically a stronger association than a very small one, right? So let's look at some examples of this. Again, numerators in here are going to be um, the number of people who have the outcome in question, right? So this is an example of a, a study they did um, where they're looking at rates of meningococcal disease in college students over a particular period of time here. So the numerator would be the number of people with meningococcal disease that gets reported to state health departments or up to the CDC over a year, right? The denominator for this is going to be the risk. Um, <clears> They're <throat> going to be risk estimates coming from uh, basically the Department of Education. So we're looking at all college students, and then as being the number of people at risk because they're in college, uh, and then looking at the rates of meningococcal disease for them. And so they're looking to see, based on characteristics of those patients, um, what the relative risk was um, between different groups to see okay, well, who's at most risk for developing meningococcal disease, right? And so what you can see here is they look at the number of cases they had. Um, and again, usually they have some kind of like population modifier here. So again, times, you know, 1 million people 
or in this case here, they'd say there's 14.6 cases per 1 million people happening there. And so by doing that, you can then start to get some comparisons here. And notice they're reporting the relative risk versus people who are not of this category. And then they give you a 95% confidence interval here, okay? And so I'll kind of go through some of these. And we've talked about these before, but I again want to reiterate it just to make sure you guys are on, on the same page as me, okay? So what are they looking for here? So they're looking at the number of cases in each of these characteristic groups as compared to people not in those groups to see what the relative risk for them getting meningococcal disease was. And so here you can see that there, uh, for instance, that there are 18 to 23 years, non-students, so this is probably the kind of their baseline here. Um, they said, okay, the relative risk for them getting meningococcal disease 1.4. That means that they're 40% more likely to develop it than people who are not 18 to 23 who are students. And so you can see what the actual, so their risk is actually increased here. And you can see what their actual, the 95% confidence interval would be if you then expanded that out to all people in the, say in the US, for instance, that had that, um, that met those criteria. You see it ranges between 1.3 and 1.7. Because this is a relative risk, you're going to see that um, if the 95% confidence interval includes one, then it's not going to be statistically significant, okay? Because of the fact that if, if it was 10 divided by 10, then that relative risk is one. So one means no difference between the groups. And so in these cases here, I could reject the null hypothesis and say, yeah, if you're 18 to 23 and a non-student, you're more likely to develop meningococcal disease, okay? Now, similarly, you can find some cases here where it actually was more of a protective sort of thing there. So just looking at all college students, they're looking to see here, they actually was 40% less likely to develop an endococcal disease because their relative risk was only 0.6. It's actually reduced. And again, this is uh, statistically significant because 0.5 to 0.8 does not encompass one, okay? Look for one that is gonna be not statistically significant. So this one, for instance, here being male, even though it looks like it might be a slight protective factor, you can notice here that because relative risk is only 80% of what it would be otherwise, um, you can see here is 0.6 to one. So because it includes one, that would not be statistically significant. We can't really say whether or not being a male affects your rates of developing meningococcal disease or not, okay? Um, similarly, if you were white, we can also say that as well. Um, but most of everything else looks like it was statistically significant. So. Um, let's look at another ways we can do this. So let's say we we're looking at this um, distribution. They're looking at coronary risk and outcomes according to a quintile group for total physical activity score at baseline and relative risk of coronary events. So what does that mean? Well, basically, let's say we were taking uh, a study of various females. And so we broke them up into groups based on physical activity. So based on their definition, they basically said, okay, going from lowest degree of physical activity all the way up to highest degree of physical activity, right? So however they define that. Um, I guess to do it on, on met hour per week. So they're finding the median for these here, okay? And so typically you'd end up using, um, this is your baseline is the, the lowest quintile. So they're looking to see does increased physical activity, what effect does that have on your risk for coronary events, okay? And so you can see again, the median values there, it's just describing what they found. And so they're looking at different risk indicators. So um, looking to see what percentage of the group had each of these indicators here. So in some of this kind of makes sense, right? So you figure people with lower physical activity might be inclined to have uh, more unhealthy habits than people who are at high physical activity. So for instance, you see a higher percentage of these people are smokers, um, a higher percentage of them tend to have hypertension, um, diabetes rates were higher. You know, a lot of this stuff does make intuitive sense. And it's good that they show that because, um, again, you can see that um, you want to make sure that the data makes sense with what you would expect. You know, use of multivitamin supplement was higher in the more active group. You know, it makes sense. They're, they're more healthy. They might have more healthful activities like taking a multivitamin. Okay. You also looked at um, age. And again, some of these things you want to um, try to normalize out to make sure that um, some data is similar to one another. So that way you um, don't try to introduce any kind of confounders, right? So for instance, you'd want the age to be similar. So that way you're not comparing, you know, 80 year old women who may have lower physical activity than someone who's like 30, for instance, who might be more likely just to be more physically active because they're younger. So and again, here you can see that the ages were pretty similar amongst the groups, okay? So then they have the outcomes, how many people in that group actually had cardiovascular outcomes. And so you can look at it just right there and you're like, well, yeah, it looks like the people who had more physical activity had fewer um, coronary events. But again, you want to do the actual statistics to find out, right? And so what you can see here is looking at the relative risk. And notice here, they can they do it two ways. One, they did age adjusted, where they just account for age. 
and then they did the multivariate analysis. Here, I'm going to pull this up so you can see a little better. And they did multivariate, meaning they accounted for all these other risk indicators. So they took out the effect of smoking. They took out the effect of hypertension and diabetes. So they just want to see what is the effect of exercise in the risk of coronary artery disease, coronary events, however they define that. And so again, we use one as our baseline because this is sort of our baseline group. We want to see if people with greater physical activity have lower risk. And you can see the relative risk, how it changes. And again, it was strongest if you, the strongest association was held if you just look at the age adjusted one because of the fact that you have to include all these other risk indicators that could be affecting this. So smoking could be affecting it, diabetes, all of that. Um, but you can see definitely there's a downward trend here. The more active you are, it appears that you're lower at risk for having coronary events. And you're like, well, no, duh. Why do we need to research that? Well, because this is what informs that in the first place. Maybe there's some kind of counterintuitive thing or a paradoxical effect happening that we don't know about. That's so why you got to do the research. When you did the multivariate, notice because they're taking out of the picture uh, a lot of these factors here that could be leading to them to be more likely to develop coronary events like smoking, um, that the association is not as strong. So it still reduced your risk. Exercise still reduced the risk, just not as greatly as if you then also included all the other healthy habits that those people have, right? Now, could there be other confounders here that we don't know about that they didn't include? Absolutely. So you have to kind of think through that and be like, well, if I did this study, I would have included something like this. It may affect it. Um, and that's a, a totally appropriate critique whenever you're evaluating a journal article. Okay. Uh, let's see. So we're looking now at risk of clinical outcomes for women uh, taking, this is a good one. So looking at women who are taking estrogen plus progestin or placebo during uh, this really big study. If you ever hear about like landmark um, women's health studies, the World Women's Health Initiative. This is actually huge uh, back in the day. I actually know one of my um, professors in college, he's actually one of the, the uh, main authors on that and actually changed a lot of how we utilize estrogen and progestin for hormone replacement therapy in post menopausal women. What they wanted to look at was to see if there's any difference in risk for a variety of different uh, outcomes based on women who are receiving estrogen plus progestin uh, replacement or just placebo, right? So you can see the number of people here in each of the categories. Notice here the numbers are pretty big, which is good. That means you have a nicely powered study to find a difference. And you can see what the actual rates of coronary disease, stroke, all of that between the different groups. And then what you can do is you can take this estrogen progestin group and compare their rates to placebo to get a risk ratio, right? So again, your denominator here is gonna be the placebo in terms of like how you're actually doing that risk because you wanna figure out if the estrogen and progestin are causing increased effect or if they're protective in some ways, right? So what you found here is that there's a risk ratio 1.29 so meaning you have an increased chance of having heart disease, coronary heart disease, when by about 29% over that if you just were not taking any estrogen and progestin at all, right? And then you can actually break this down into the risk difference per 10,000 uh, people if you follow them for a year. And we'll talk more about this in epidemiology. This is just a good way to sort of um, rationalize out the, the number of um, events that this causes. Basically saying that if you followed 10,000 women for a year, you'd find seven more cases of coronary heart disease and those taking estrogen and progestin than if they hadn't been, right? That's an easier number to sort of understand how many more people are dying or having an event versus just knowing that, okay, there's a 29% increase in chance. What does that mean? Um, for stroke, you can see here, elevated risk ratio, pulmonary embolism was actually very strongly associated. Your risk were double if you were receiving uh, estrogen and progestin replacement for having a PE versus nothing, which is pretty crazy. Um, Breast cancer risk was up there, but then some things were actually protective, right? So things like colorectal cancer risk and risk for hip fracture are reduced. And that actually does make sense if you think about um, the effects of estrogen on bone and what happens in postmenopausal women and things like that. So again, just ways of using relative risk or using risk ratios in order to give us an idea of how risk changes when you introduce some sort of intervention, okay? Or you're comparing two different groups together there. Um, again, this is another case of looking at risk factors for meningococcal disease, kind of going back to that. Um, again, using your, um, actually this uh, case here, they're looking at a case control study. Um, note here, for case control studies, you're using odds ratios versus with like cohort studies and prospective you know, randomized control studies using relative risk. The reason for that is, if you recall, back to when we talked about uh, case control studies, is that you don't have like a defined population. You don't really have a defined denominator um, because again, the disease state in question is probably pretty rare. You're only looking at a relatively small number of people who had the condition. And so because of that, you don't really know the total number of people who are at risk to have that in the first place. So instead of using um, relative risk where you have to know the full 
uh, denominator, here we're going to do odds. So you look at the number of people who had exposure to the risk factor or not, okay? And so in a study like this, they're looking at the number of people who are cases, which are people who actually developed an endococcal disease versus people who are not, right? So notice here, this is about a three to one ratio between cases versus the controls, right? So, which is pretty typical, like we talked about before, you want to control, uh, match controls to the cases in order to take out into uh, account, you know, things like gender, age, and ethnicity, and stuff like that, right? Um, big obvious things that might have, may have an effect on um, your study results. And so what they found was by doing the odds ratios, which can be similar to a risk ratio in terms of um, how it's calculated, it's just a little bit different. So just know the odds ratio is done for case control studies. Know that relative risk is gonna be used for cohort studies and randomized studies, okay? But you're still using a ratio. So that still means that if your 95% confidence interval encompasses one or includes one, then it's not gonna be statistically significant, okay? So for instance, here being a freshman in here, so again, they're taking, they're using retrospective data, they find, okay, these are the people with meningococcal disease, here are the controls that didn't. Let's look backwards to see, did they have any of these risk factors? Were they a freshman, yes or no? They look at the number of people of cases who are freshmen versus those that weren't. So what are the odds of those people being freshmen versus not, right? And so they found that their uh, odds ratio was three times as high for people with meningococcal disease to be a freshman, okay? Kind of makes sense, you're being exposed to a new environment, you know, risk goes up for sure. And that, again, the, um, the confidence interval does not include one, so the p-value is gonna be less than 0.05, and in this case here is 0.001, right? So this kind of backs up what you're reviewing here. Um, looking at things, and you can, again, compare these together to see which ones are more strongly associated with the uh, exposure to the risk factor in, in having the disease uh, versus things that may be protective, right? So for instance, here you see that being a freshman in a dormitory had a higher odds ratio than just being a freshman by itself, right? Kind of makes sense because you're in an enclosed environment, um, all packed in like sardines in your dorm rooms, things like that. So again, you can see all the things that are strongly associated with it. Notice here that being uh, white race was interesting. It was uh, 5.4, but you notice here, look at the confidence interval, look how wide that is. It goes anywhere between 1.2 to 24.2. It's huge wide confidence interval versus some of this other stuff that maybe only went from say 1.6 to 5.9. Usually when you see that, that usually means that there was not maybe enough data to really give you a tight confidence interval. The numbers were pretty low. It was still statistically significant, but if you were to then apply that to the, uh, the population at large, it would be difficult to actually tell where the real number would be. So it's, this is less useful, even though it does appear to be uh, certainly associated with that bigger risk, okay? Um, but some things, appeared to be somewhat protective. So for instance, being employed during school was protective, even though it was just almost not statistically significant, right? Because it goes up to 0.98. If it included one, it would have not been significant. And that bears out in the p-value being pretty close to 0.05. Um, or attending more than one movie for whatever reason, maybe getting out of the dorms and getting some fresh air was protective. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, please stop me and I can just make some mentions there. Um, probably check the sticky board to see if you guys have any pertinent questions though. What exactly is Journal Club? Oh, I'll tell you guys about that in just a little bit. Just you wait, it's super fun. If you don't believe me, I pity you. I'm just kidding, it'll be fun. Um, so another thing to consider too uh, when looking at risk is uh, not only the relative risk is you know kind of um, taking risk in one group divided by your control group, for instance, being a relative risk. You can also figure out what the attributable risk is. You can figure out what the risk is that's attributable to having a particular risk factor. Right, so this is a case here where they're looking at relative risk and attributable risk of cigarette smoking for lung cancer and heart disease. Okay, so they're looking at death rate for 100,000 of the population uh, from lung cancer and from coronary disease. And then they compare that to heavy smokers versus non smokers. You can see the cases here. So heavy smokers are dying from lung cancer, 223 cases out of you know, per 100,000 people. Uh, from coronary disease, 516 per 100,000 for heavy smokers, and you can then compare that to non-smokers. So to figure out what the actual relative risk is, you can see here that it would just be this, it'd be 223 divided by seven. You can see that the relative risk is 32 times higher for heavy smokers to die from lung cancer than for non-smokers, makes sense. Versus here though, you notice that the relative risk is much um, closer. So here it's 516 divided by 361 or 1.4. So your chance is only 40% higher of dying from coronary disease by being a heavy smoker than if you were a non-smoker, which makes sense because even if you're not a smoker, heart disease is still pretty, you know, it's still pretty common. 
So even though you're looking at the rates for lung cancer, the risk is extremely high for being a heavy smoker. Um, the This is a much stronger association than if it was just um, looking at coronary disease specifically, okay? Now what you can do is also look at the attributable risk because again, some people who are non-smokers still got lung cancer. And so you can say, looking at this, that the attributable risk for death from lung cancer was 216 cases because basically you're just subtracting out what the actual uh, contribution was from the, the control group of the non-smokers here. Or in the case of heart uh, coronary disease, 155. You can still get confidence intervals with this but remember that now that you're doing a uh, tributal risk or a risk reduction, you would see that um, because you're subtracting one thing from another, if these are the same, the value would be zero. So when you're looking at a risk reduction or a tributable risk, if the confidence interval includes a zero, then it will not be statistically significant, okay? So that's the difference there. I want you to make sure you kind of have that clear because when you're evaluating this stuff, um, that's gonna be critical to making proper uh, Conclusions. Okay. okay, so let's look at, uh, you know, okay, so we can see there's a relative risk there. Some of these things make good sense. Um, sometimes, though, they don't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. So you find a lot of associations, but not really, they may not be super appropriate, right? So let's look at an example of this. Let's look at um, confounders. Confounders are very important to consider whenever reviewing medical literature. Um, basically, these are alternative things that could be affecting the data that you're finding. So let's look at a, a, an example here of baldness. So um, you have yes cases, and this is another case control study, but you look at baldness, or no, yes or no, and you look at cigar smoking. Now, I don't know if anyone knows of a particular association of people who are cigar smokers, uh, who happen to be more, more bald than not, well, maybe like Lex Luthor or someone like that. I mean, it seems like he would be, or uh, Kingpin, he'd probably be chomping on a cigar. Um, but do you, we actually think that cigar smoking and baldness are related? Well, looking at this, the relative odds would be 6.2. So it looks like people who are cigar smokers have a relative odds of being um, bald 6.2 times higher, right? Or I should say people who are bald are 6.2 times more likely to be uh, cigar smokers. You're like, well, wait a second, does that even make sense? Is there some other contributory factor there? Well, what if we went ahead and then broke it down based on like age, for instance? Let's just look at bald men 40 to 45 years old um, with aged match controls, okay? Before, we didn't take age into account here. We were just looking at whether or not they were bald and whether they had cigar smokers. Now, let's look at actual age controls because, again, our 20-year-old, 20-year-olds more likely to be smoking cigars or like you know, maybe middle-aged gentlemen. Probably the middle-aged ones, I would uh, assume. Um, of course, that you can certainly buck that trend, but, um, you know, that's what I would assume. We all know what, what happens when we make assumptions, though. But anyway, so we're, we're uh, going to be breaking it down based on age controls, and so that way you only have people who are 40 to 45 being compared with other 40 to 45-year-olds, right? And so what you then find, when you look at this, is that the relative odds is only 0.85. Now it appears that it's protective, that people who are bald are less likely to be cigar smokers. So again, there's a confounding variable there of age. And so that's why we want to make sure that researchers are controlling for this stuff in order to not develop these erroneous results, okay? So basically, when you're looking at two things, you're looking at a characteristic factor, the cause, and then you're looking at the effect or the outcome, there's an apparent relationship here, but there's something else actually affecting it, right? So that's what we got to figure out. And that's what we need to control for when doing these research um, experiments. And that's what you should be looking for when you're reading the literature. So how do we deal with confounding? So for example, here is a study looking at mean daily sugar consumption in 20 patients with heart disease and then 25 control subjects. So look at the heart disease, so patients had 20 and 25 in the controls and look at sugar consumption. So certainly it does look higher just based off of that alone. So you may come to the conclusion, okay, well, people who have heart disease consume more sugar. Is that always the case though? Well, we can then break it down. So then looking at smoking as a confounder, we can then try to factor that in. So then we looked at people with heart disease. We then looked at smokers versus non-smokers, and then the control subject smokers versus non-smokers, and then we looked at their sugar consumption. What do you notice? Actually, it looks like you know people who have are smokers might also have higher sugar consumption than people who are non-smokers. Again, if you have one unhealthy habit, perhaps you have other unhealthy habits like eating a lot of sugar-containing foods. And so maybe that is a causal link, because certainly we know that smoking can lead to coronary uh, uh, heart disease. And so that was a confounder. By taking that into account, you then find that the actual um, rates of sugar consumption between um, you know, non-smokers 
non-smoker, heart disease versus control, it's much tighter, right? The, the actual differences here are much closer. There still could be an association there, but we at least want to take into account the confounders where appropriate. Okay, so how do we deal with that confounding? Again, this is a relationship between sugar consumption and heart disease. We found that smoking was a confounder. It was affecting the results until we took out that, um, took out that effect, or at least controlled for it. Right. And so we find that, you know, when you're looking at the association there, um, you know, it was still held constant. You still found that people who are uh, had heart disease still had higher sugar consumption, even if you took out into account. So smoking factored in, but it wasn't the only thing there. It didn't completely erase um, the association there. So both sugar and smoking probably relate to heart problems, which we, we know now to be pretty make pretty good sense. But I know always been the case back in the day. As I mentioned here, we're using that multivariate analysis. This is a way to account for all of those confounders. So in this case here, looking back at the different quintiles of physical activity in these women, when they did the multivariate analysis, they controlled for age, smoking, ethanol, MVI use, all of that, in order to find what difference uh, just the exercise alone has, or at least all the confounders that they include here. And so you can, you can see that it, does um, lessen the the association. It doesn't appear to be as big of a reduction in risk for um, heart disease, but it still is there, right? And so again, this is why we take into account other things than just age. We factor in things like their habits um, where appropriate and things like that. Now, if you were doing, say, for instance, like a, a randomized controlled trial, by randomizing your patients into either intervention or control, um, you will find that you naturally will account for that. Just do due to natural randomization, um, that patients will tend to balance each other out in those groups, and that's oftentimes what people report on in their uh, results section. They'll talk about the groups and they'll compare the two together just so you can see, yeah, they're pretty similar to one another and where, where it actually counts, okay? Um, and again, here you can even see there's a case where um, even looking at things like doses of medication can actually make a difference in terms of the results that you find there. So for instance, um, this is one where they're looking at uh, risk for endometrial cancer in women who are receiving different dosages of um, uh, an estrogen here. And you can see looking at never used as being sort of their baseline um, versus people had less than 0.5 milligrams a day all the way up to greater than 1.25. You can then see how the change in dose can even have an effect here. And so you can see the relative risk actually goes up higher as you get to a bigger dose up to a certain point. And what you notice here is sort of plateaus out. And it looks like it goes down, but it's probably just kind of due to natural variation there. So you can see the confidence intervals um, begin because you're looking at a relative risk because this does not include one, they are statistically significant, okay? But again, here it was pretty close for the less than 0.5. So, you know, while there is an increase in relative risk, it's pretty close to not being statistically significant. So it's not a super strong association there. So um, basically when you're reading the literature, you wanna make sure that the author sort of address the possibility of confounders affecting their data, um, especially if they have like a small number of patients who are recruited, um, where you find that people don't tend to balance each other out just because there's not enough of them. And then if they are identifying confounders, make sure the list is reasonable, that it's something that actually has something to do with the outcome they're interested in. If uh, you're looking at a, a article on coronary heart disease, you want to make sure that they're accounting for diabetes status, that you're accounting for BMI, uh, for smoking, all the different things there. And then are there any known risks not included? That's an you know, omission. Uh, you know, it could be important. Why did they omit a particular risk factor that you think it's important? Um, and how could that be playing a role there? So that's something you want to think about when you're actually looking at this stuff. And then have they taken steps to confound for this, um, either by matching you know, controls the cases effectively or through randomization strategies or all these different things. There's a lot of techniques to go into it, and that's where you'll find that in the methods there. And then have they supplied evidence that potentially causal factors are not confounded? What additional evidence is there to suggest causality? So basically they're saying, okay, well, looking at the strength of association, does it make consistent sense from a biological standpoint? Does it make sense from a dose response relationship? Does everything kind of make sense how you would think things would work naturally? If not, then there could be a confounder that's affecting the results there. Okay, so that's the end of this section. See if you guys have questions um, other than that. Here's here. I got uh, hotkeys now for my scene switching, so I'm getting improvements in my, my workflow here. Anyway, um, so I'll talk about recommendation for studying in just a little bit. What exactly is Journal Club? I'll show you later. So I'm gonna upload a, um, a journal club rubric, basically kind of what questions we're gonna ask ourselves when we go through an article. Uh, and we're gonna work through it together. So it's gonna be an interactive um, interactive sort of event where I'm gonna be asking people to give me their thoughts 
on the article. So I'm gonna expect you to look at the stuff beforehand. I know it sounds scary and I hate calling on people randomly. I really don't like to do it, but I'm gonna make the process as random as possible. Uh, and it will not be a, a, a will be a judgment free zone. I expect you to get stuff wrong because you're still new with this. It's fine. Don't worry about it. But uh, that'll be for the next time we meet. That'll be before our review there. So just you wait. Um, Someone said, can you explain the difference in criteria for a data being insignificant at a CI of zero versus a CI of one? Yes. So if I am looking at, um, are we going to have to design a research project anytime soon? This stuff gives me a ton of anxiety. Hey guys. Um, yes, you will, but it'll be in the summer. Don't you worry. It's actually going to be, um, you're not doing any kind of like interventional research. It's like doing literature searches. So it won't be too bad, but you do get to come up with your own idea. And I think a lot of people have fun with that because they choose things that are interesting to them. Um, yeah, I'm going to work on getting my stream deck here pretty soon. So I can start getting little animations of the play, play across the screen, perhaps. Um, I do want to get to this point here though. So, right. So when you're looking at something, um, the best way I can describe it is if you are looking at a ratio of things. So if I'm dividing one group by another, then if there's no difference between them, if I take 10 divided by 10, there's no difference, then the difference or the uh, ratio is one, right? 10 divided by 10 is one. So if a ratio, my null hypothesis is there's no difference between the groups, then I would be able to say that uh, if they, the confidence interval included one, I would say there's no statistical significance there, okay? If I was subtracting one thing from another, if I subtracted 10 from 10, that's zero, okay? So in those cases there, if I'm doing like a risk reduction or if I'm doing attributable risk where I'm subtracting one thing from another, if there's no difference, then it's zero. And so if my confidence interval includes zero, then it's gonna be non-significant. Actually, I think I wrote an email to somebody. I wanna see if I can pull this up. Uh, I'm not gonna pull up your email, but I apologize if you, if you don't mind sticking with me for a few minutes here. I wrote like a really good example. Oh, I sent it. Yeah, what other questions do you guys have? Okay, so here's a good example. I just kind of wrote this out. What word? I was like, what in the f doing? What is he taking? Okay. And perfect. Okay, so you guys can see my word uh, window up now. Hopefully, it's kind of covering my face a little bit. Okay, so I apologize to the person. I, I, this is from an email that I wrote to someone back, but I figured it was a good example here. So let's say we're looking at um, performing a study. We're doing a new antihypertensive, okay? Let me know if you guys can't see that. But um, basically 50 people get drug A and 50 people are gonna get drug B, okay? So when looking at this, if I'm testing a new antihypertensive, what's my null hypothesis would be? Or what would it be? So the null hypothesis is basically gonna be that the drug I'm introducing, the intervention has no effect on mean blood pressure or the differences that I see are gonna be identical between drug A and drug B. No differences between groups. So that's my null hypothesis, right? So I'm hoping to reject that by showing that there is a difference or the differences that I find are very unlikely to be due to chance alone, okay? So let's look at this. Let's say we run the experiment and we get a mean difference in systolic blood pressure of five millimeters of mercury between the two groups, okay? So I subtracted the difference there. The mean difference between those two is five millimeters of mercury, okay? So the 95% confidence interval, and again, I'm just making up these numbers, but it ranged from negative one all the way up to eight millimeters of mercury, okay? So just off of that, I can say that this is not statistically significant because it encompasses zero. Because it encompasses zero, this means that if I were then to extrapolate out, this out to the actual population, I reran this study with the whole US population, it could be a chance that there's absolutely no difference between these two. Because when I subtract one from the other, if there is no difference, then that difference would be zero, right? So looking at this, you can see that the p-value is 0.07, so I would not be able to reject the null hypothesis. I would not be able to say that this new drug is any better at reducing blood pressure than drug B, okay? So again, I would say the results are not statistically significant, and I could not reject the null hypothesis. Now again, here, the thing is, it doesn't mean that the drug didn't work, it's just I could not find a difference with the experiment that I ran. 
This could be due to um, the design of the study, could be due to only having 50 people in each group, because sometimes studies can be underpowered to find a difference, right? It just means I cannot reject the null. So let's rerun the experiment, but now we increase the power by, and again, increase power, not like in voltage, but like an actual number of observations. And so I increase that, so now my n is 500 in each group. Now I've increased it by a factor of 10, right? So now I do the same experiment. I give 500 of them drug A and 500 of them drug B, follow them for a period of time. And then now I get a mean difference in systolic blood pressure of six millimeters of mercury with a 95% confidence interval of two to nine. Now in this case here, because it does not include zero, I am able to reject the null hypothesis. And you can see that with the p-value being 0.003. It went from two to nine, does not include zero. And I'm just subtracting mean blood pressure from group A to group B. And yet there's no difference, it would be zero, right? Because n minus 10 is zero. So in this case here, this would be significant. So now I can say, okay, now that I have more power, I was able to find a statistically significant difference and I can safely reject the null hypothesis as the mean systolic blood pressures, this different from one another is unlikely due to random chance alone, okay? That way I can infer that the medication works. Now the question is, would I actually consider this to be clinically significant of a difference of only six millimeters of mercury? Maybe, maybe not, right? It depends on what's considered to be statistically or clinically significant for your particular practice. Yeah, so just to clarify, it's not significant because the value of zero is within the confidence interval range. For that first example, yes. Because uh, it included zero, then we could not reject the null hypothesis and say that it was statistically significant. It was not, okay? On the second example, though, it does not include zero, so we can go ahead and say that yes, it is statistically significant and reject that. Now, if I was to do, say, a ratio here, a relative ratio of blood pressures between one another, instead of zero being my point of um, uh, statistical significance, it would be one. Because again, if I was to take the systolic blood pressure in each group, mean systolic blood pressure, I divide one by the other. If it was one, then that would again mean there's no difference between the two. So hopefully that example makes some sense um, to you. You can go back to this video if you wanted to read that again and get some more clarification there. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Let me know if that does not. So what is it when you would reject the null when, um, um, so what is it when you would reject the null? There you go, um, when the value is one. So that has to do with um, looking at the ratios, right? So if I was to divide the mean systolic blood pressure in one group and divide it by the other, and if it was, um, if they were the same, second here, over the, the stream's looking good enough, but um, if they were the same as a ratio, then that value is one. So if the confidence interval includes one, then I cannot reject that null hypothesis there. The CIs either included zero or they didn't. Where would division or subtraction come into play? So in this case here, the example I was showing, that was subtraction because I was saying the difference, again, notice the nomenclature, the difference in uh, the two mean systolic blood pressure, the difference being one subtracted by the other. That's why I was looking at a difference there, looking at subtraction, that's where it's the level of significance is zero. And don't worry if you're not like, having a hard time getting this because like everyone has a hard time getting this. This is tough stuff, right? Um, again, we don't have all the math and everything to really back us up to get a more uh, deep understanding, but I'm also trying to teach you kind of what you just need to know for clinical practice, right? Because don't, you're never going to do this math yourself. Okay, so someone said for the p-value, if it's greater than 0.05, then you cannot reject the null, and if it's less than 0.05, you can reject the null. Absolutely, right? If you set your alpha to 0.05, then if it's less than 0.05, your p-value, then you say, yeah, I can reject the null hypothesis. If it's greater than, then you can't, right? Um, if I set my alpha to 0.01 though, then now I have my P has to be less than 0.01, but 99% of the time alpha is set at 0.05. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Oh, another thing I wanted to point out here that I wanted to make mention of, um, just for illustration purposes, I want to make sure that everyone kind of understands, um, standard deviations and, um, the bell curve, right. And how that kind of works out. So let's say for instance, um, I was going to draw out, uh, an example of a bell curve here. I appreciate you guys sticking with me. Um, I know I'm ending a little early, so that's probably fine. Let's imagine I was drawing a bell curve here. And again, this is not gonna be very pretty, but it is what it is. So, and then our mean value is gonna be right here in the middle, correct? So when looking at something like this, um, recall like what are the percentages of observations that are gonna fall within certain ranges, right? So when I say that, what I'm talking about is, imagine if you were to go this direction, what percentage of observations are you gonna find there? Well, it'd probably be 50% because anything greater than the mean, because the mean is the 50% mark, so 
50% of observation will be greater than the mean. 50% is going to be lower than the mean, right? Pretty easy sense. Well, what if we started to include our standard deviations? Because I think it's an important point. I want to make sure everyone gets it. It's tough when I'm not teaching a live lecture because I can't see the actual visible confusion on your face. I just have to assume you have visible confusion. Um, and I want to make sure I can illustrate these points again. So let's say we start looking at standard deviations away from the mean itself. And I'm going to try to make this as even as I can. So this is going to be one standard deviation away. Okay. One S D and one SD here, right? So again, this standard deviation, how far away from the mean this is, this can vary, right? Depending on the data, how varied it is around the mean, but it can, it can range, right? And again, I'll give you values for that. I'll tell you on the exam, okay, the standard deviation is 10 or 15, whatever the case may be, depending on the value that we're looking at. And so remember, what percentage of values lies within one standard deviation of either side of the mean here, right? It's 68%. Right, 68% of the values are going to fall between, assuming this is normally distributed data, and again, apologize for my handwriting, 68% of the values are going to fall between those two standard deviations. From here to here, 68%, okay? Not a super helpful number, but about two-thirds of observations are going to fall between these two values, which makes sense if you kind of look at the area under the curve here. Now, what if I went ahead and did two standard deviations away to a different color, so this makes a little bit more sense. Let's say I go two standard deviations away now. All right, I've got two standard deviations, right? So what percentage of observations are now between here and here? Well, between two standard deviations, it is 95%. This means that basically 2.5% of observations are this direction, or a really bad one. Two and a half percent are going to go this direction, and then two and a half percent of observations are going to be in this direction. So 95% of all your values should be somewhere in this range of two standard deviations. Okay. And then if we went three standard deviations, that'd be 99%. Not commonly done, but that's what you would see that. Okay. So how can I make this clinically applicable to you all? Let's say, for example, I'm going to give you an illustration here just because, again, I want to hammer home the point. Um, let's say, for instance, that we were looking at um, potassium levels. Right. Let's say we were saying what, what an average potassium level is, let's say four. Right. And then again, this doesn't have to be clinically absolutely right. But let's say it's four. And the equivalent is per liter. Let's do 4.0. And then it has a standard deviation. So our mean value is four. And then our standard deviation is, let's say, 0.5. So SD equals 0.5. So this means that each standard deviation I go up, I'm moving up 4.5, 5, and then above that would be 5.5 .5 to three standard deviations. And again, as you can imagine, as you get further and further away from that mean, you're gonna find fewer and fewer people that actually um, are gonna have values that extremely far away, right? You're not gonna have a whole lot of people that are measuring 5.5 .5 unless something's wrong with the patient, right? So these are normal, healthy people. But I could ask you, I could say, well, what would be the percentage of patients who would have a value Let's say between three and five. So knowing the standard deviation and knowing what the mean is, I can automatically tell you that. So I know if I go to this direction, so I go 4.5 and five. So a value of five is right here, right? 5.0. And then I know that a value of three, if I go four to three and a half to three, 3.0, I can figure out the number of people who are likely to have a potassium level in between these two values here. Or you assume correctly, yes, that's a uh, totally reasonable. Um, so anyway, so I can figure out what the percentage of people who have the number of values between three and five. I can say, okay, well, it's two standard deviations in either direction. So I know that's 95% of people, 95% of people will have a value between three, five. Okay, which makes some physiologic sense, I think. Normal potassium levels are like three and a half to five, but um, that, that does make a sense, I think. Um, similarly, I could also ask you, well, what are the percentage of patients who would have values outside of the range of three to five? And since 95% is gonna include these two standard deviations here, that, that would mean there's 5% outside of this, right? 95 plus five is 100. So 5% of patients are gonna have values outside of three to five. 
Or I could say that the percentage of patients who will have values less than three is only gonna be two and a half percent. And the number of patients who are gonna have values greater than five would be two and a half percent, right? So I can kind of ask the question either way, but the main point is to understand what the standard deviation means in conjunction with the mean, and to understand the percentage of people who are gonna have values that reside within that sort of range there, okay? Because again, you're gonna find that the further you get in terms of extremes, then fewer people are gonna have those values because those people are more likely to be outliers at that point, right? It'd be very unlikely to find someone who has a potassium of six unless there's something very wrong with them, right? Or you maybe hemolyze a sample or something. But um, so I just wanna make sure you guys got a good understanding of that to make sure you, again, I think it's an important concept to understand there. Like where, where does 95% come from and all that? That's basically, it. it's two standard deviations around the mean, okay? Um, let me see here. So someone's asking, what is it when you would reject the null when the value includes one or value is one? So if you're doing a ratio, so if I'm saying I'm doing a relative risk, relative meaning you're doing a ratio or an odds ratio, I'm dividing one thing by another. If the 95% confidence interval includes one, then you cannot reject the null hypothesis. Because if one thing divided by another is the same, then that value is one, right? Green divided by green is one. 10 divided by 10 is one. So um, you cannot reject the null hypothesis and say that there's a difference there because there's a chance that there is no difference there, okay? All right, what other questions do you have? So in terms of studying for the exam, I think I might've talked about this one before too. Um, just make sure you understand sort of the concepts that we're going, get the definitions down, and be able to interpret sort of the things we're going through. Be able to look at um, something, recognize that it's a risk ratio, and look at the confidence interval and determine whether or not it was statistically significant or not. I know it sounds tough, but I will give you some examples here. We're gonna do it with the journal club. So we actually go through this. We're gonna look at some confidence intervals and we're gonna look at some p-values here. Just wait, let me see from the studies. Oh yeah, look at these wonderful graphs and all this. this is my favorite stuff ever, you know? So we can see we're gonna talk about values and confidence intervals and all that kind of good stuff here. Um, so just you wait, it'll make more clinical sense here in just a little bit. Um, and I'll make you feel confident going into this test. Maybe not completely confident, but mostly confident. Any other questions I can answer for you before I let you all go? If not, thank you all for joining me. Um, you've all been great. Thank you for asking a ton of questions. This is um, what I need to hear to make sure you all have a good understanding of this stuff. I do not want to leave anyone hanging. Um, no one's going to get left behind on my watch if I can help it. Thank you. No problem. You guys have a great day. I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. If you have any questions, though, either post them up and I'll get to them next time, or um, I will check my email and see if you guys have anything there. Yeah, you guys have a great day. Great weekend. Enjoy your Friday. I will see you all later.